It is a civil war that killed over a million people, the darkest chapter in the history of Nigeria, amid massive starvation and claims of genocide. It began as the Igbo people declared the southeast of the country Biafra independent. Federal forces invaded but were initially outgunned by Biafran soldiers. That vote was reversed, with more sophisticated weaponry obtained mostly from Britain trying to protect its oil industry and also from Russia seeing a chance to increase its influence in Africa. France, though, provided assistance to Biafra, describing the situation as genocide. As Nigerian troops advanced, the Biafrans lost control of the oil fields. And without the funds for food, the Biafran people began to starve, bringing about the end of the war in 1970. The people actually just fashioned in this war. There are a number of tribes that make up Biafra. These suffered jointly. They were massacred. They were kicked out of what was then the Federation of Nigeria. They came out, decided to make a home of their own. And as it went on, a nation grew mm. out of the amalgam of tribes. Now there is a nation, a Biafran people. Nowadays, the region continues to suffer from high unemployment and corruption, leading to a renewed outbreak of anger, particularly amongst the young. Amnesty claims more than 150 peaceful protesters were killed between the summers of 2015 and 2016 by Nigeria's security forces in what it called a chilling campaign to repress renewed demands to create a breakaway state. The police say crackdowns have been in response to killings by separatists. Well, Rosie Collier revisits Biafra for France 24. <laughs> The first shots of the war were exchanged here in Abudu, what was then the northernmost point of Biafra. Gunfights between troops and the market sent civilians running. Shops were looted as soldiers advanced. Augustine Ogo was 10 years old when the war broke out. Politician and a writer, today he is a well-known figure in the town. His first recollection of the war is etched deeply into his memory. I followed some adults who were running through a bush path towards her backyard, towards a farmyard. That was how we ran. I only had my pants on and I ran and followed them, not knowing where I was going. But I, since I know them, I had to run and follow them. We went to the Edna villages and settled in one other place, in, the, in one of the villages. We were there for some time. It was difficult to get food. Starvation was widespread. Nigeria imposed an air and sea blockade on Biafra. Hunger became a weapon of war. One million Biafran children died of malnutrition in the months that followed. Nigerian troops ransacked civilian food stores and poisoned wells. Augustine remembers his mother and sister sneaking out in the dead of night to find food, but didn't know how they got it. Today, he has come to meet a woman who was a smuggler. As a 14-year-old, Angela had to be quick on her feet to smuggle much-needed supplies. We weren't allowed to cross the border, so we would carry things at night and hide from soldiers. Our relatives would help us gather things on this side of the border. Crossing back over, we would again have to travel under the cover of darkness. If the soldiers caught us, they would put us in trenches, torture us and force us to pay a fine. Augustine grew up hearing stories of bravery shown by Biafran soldiers in the face of Nigeria. A quarter of a million men signed up to fight in less than a year. But the reality was that Biafra's newly formed army was defeated within 30 months. Thousands of Biafran soldiers deserted towards the end. Vincent Tabarro was one of them. Fifty years on, he no longer feels any shame. At that time, everybody was scattered. Nobody, nothing was organized. And so I had to go into one of the villages, hide there for some time the, with, gun. with my gun and uniform. I, was, I had no other clothes other than the uniform. Yeah, Until a good Samaritan gave me clothes. Thousands of Biafran soldiers died in battle, and many more were injured. 
With very few hospitals, the Biafrans relied on medical assistance from foreign aid organisations. The International Committee for the Red Cross airlifted hundreds of wounded soldiers abroad for treatment. Several of them were brought to Norway. The Scandinavian country led the way in terms of donations per capita for humanitarian aid to Biafra. John Paloma was one of the Biafran soldiers to be treated in Norway. He enlisted in the Biafran army at the age of just 15. Two years later, he was lying in a hospital bed with a near fatal injury when he was told he would be sent to a hospital in Oslo. A near death experience changed John's life drastically. I've been taking care of these bullets since uh, 1969. I was injured. It ended at the back of my scapula, that is under my arm. And from there, it's been, it was there for almost nine months before it was operated out at the Norwegian hospital here. Norwegians raise millions of kroners for the humanitarian relief efforts in Biafra. The funds were a welcome lifeline for thousands of Biafrans. John went from being a combatant to becoming a humanitarian campaigner. In 1960s Norway, John was a novelty. He travelled around the country with the then Secretary General of the Norwegian Church Aid. Today he's come to find out from Atle Sommerfeld, a former NCA Secretary General, what impact Biafra had on Norwegians. So we actually had the concept in Norwegian called Biafra children, which became Biafra a concept, children, yes. uh, concept not only on people from Biafra, but starving and or hunger. And that has been a criticism, uh, you know, that, that the images placing Africans as passive recipients, uh, as everything from Africa is really uh, hunger and, and catastrophes. And um, I don't know how you look at that now. I remember that myself in the hospital. For me, it was a kind of um, reality. People can see what is really actually happening. It's interesting. So you would say that it did not dehumanize people from Biafra, but it helped Norwegians to be human. Yes. The University of Innsuka was central to the Biafran war effort. Academics and students helped design and manufacture locally made weapons. And Biafran intellectuals, who returned from other parts of the country, wrote propaganda and speeches. Chikia Fadobi is 33 years old and so wasn't born when the war is being fought. But he has developed an obsession with finding and digitalizing documents from the era. Much of his research is done here at the university where the leaders of Biafra once stood. Events that played before the civil war uh, in the larger Nigeria of how uh, the Igbos returned from every part of the country, and uh, especially the intellectuals from other parts of the country, especially the universities that exist, uh, existed at that time, they all gathered together in this uh, very institution. So it was believed that the brain, the, in, the, the, uh, the intellectuals, the um, the force, the power behind um, the secession movement was hatched here. So um, that made the, the Nigerian side, especially overzealous soldiers, uh, they took it out on the university and um, it was quite devastated. Chike is on a mission to wed history with the future through a multimedia project. The university library holds a key to his grand plan to digitalise hundreds of photos for his documentary. Many books and documents written during the war were destroyed. I'm made to know that there are some uh, information on, on some of these uh, material you have here. Can, can we just look at some of them? Now, this says a nation is born. Yes. This okay. nation was born after Juku's visit to UNN. Chike wants to find out more about the brains behind Biafra's war effort. The head of the university, Benjamin Azumba, agrees to a meeting. Benjamin is doubtful that scientific knowledge from the war will ever be used by Nigerian authorities now or in the future. They made rockets. They made the so-called uh, uh, 
weapons of uh, mass uh, destruction to an extent, and uh, a lot of other useful uh, inventions that other countries like Japan exploited that after the uh, World War. They converted their war technology into civilian technology. Germany did the same too, but the Biafran uh, uh, technology was lost. The engineering knowledge may be at risk of being lost, but much of the hardware remains. Balajat Yukubu demines unexploded ordnance from the Nigeria Biafra War. Today, he is showing community leaders some of the weapons he has unearthed. It's too heavy. This surface to air missile is made from water pipes. So you see, this and this rocket launcher was crafted mainly from a locomotive. Can travel 10 kilometers if fired. Because when you fire this gun, this whole component from up here down will depress the spring. When it depresses the spring, then the bomb takes off. Then the spring comes out. Then excess gas from the explosive escape from this smaller hole. Bala and his team of deminers have found 17,000 unexploded bombs since they started work in 2009. An estimated 300 people have been killed and 1,500 maimed, but no official figures are kept. At times it will appear in the river and we ignorantly don't know. We fetch water, we drink. It will pollute it, but you won't see it with the naked eye. Tomorrow you have a problem with kidney. It's all from this type of thing. And those of them that are getting rusty like this are the most unstable. The miners rely solely on private donors, and this millionaire has been persuaded to donate. Job. You guys are doing a wonderful oh, thank job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honestly. Mm. For those of us who say, no, we cannot close our eyes mm. for our people to be perished no. or for our people to die unnecessarily, no, no, no. we make sure that the little one we have, mm. we send it out, yes. bring it out. Fund it to make sure that this thing is done. There is much work to do to make people aware of the dangers. Armaments and unexploded ordnance still litter the countryside 50 years after guns fell silent. These children are blissfully unaware that several bombs have exploded in these grounds, ripping the limbs off their victims. The most recent fatality was in 2012. I hope we not, our tape is not there. The D miners are here to check if areas they sealed off a few months ago have been compromised. The D miners are here to make sure all these things is removed so that you can play freely here. When you saw his runaway, you thought, uh, you didn't know we're why. Not we're, we're not catching we're you. Your friends. We're, we're here to make sure that this place is safe for mm -hmm. you, the kids, so that you can play around. But for now, don't play within this don't area. Don't enter it. Don't enter it. It's dangerous. Kalechi Obasi is making a rare journey back to the village where she grew up. She had a normal childhood until she lost her leg. Her disability makes rural living very difficult. Kelechi, my daughter, it's been so long. How are you? Kelechi has come to show her parents a new pair of crutches. She was on a hospital waiting list for over a year. While it is easier for her to get around now, coming here is painful for other reasons. This is where Kelechi's accident happened 16 years ago when she was 10. So why playing? I didn't even know what I was using was a handful of objects. So I was, you know, using the cutlass to be hitting on the mental objects. At the point, the thing exploded. So why trying to? I heard the sound of boo. Why trying to run away? It was there. I didn't even know what happened afterwards. Where I got myself was at the harbour home, where they were applying medicine on my leg to a very particular time. At the time, the thing was getting rotten. Kalechi uses her experience to help educate people of the potential dangers lying in wait beneath the fertile soils of southeast Nigeria. 
The lack of resources and government intervention mean that Kalechi still has a long way to go in spreading her message. While her teenage years were spent in a darkness of ignorance about disability, in her 20s, Kalechi has found the light and wants to lead others there. Rosie Collier revisiting Biafra for France 24. Well, that's it from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. Thanks for watching. More news coming up very shortly.